بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Please excuse my voice I'm coming out of the flu Dr. John Ducantini thank you for your invitation and your sterling work at this council Patrick where are you Patrick Right here you're on Thank you as well It's a great pleasure to be back to this audience let me start by saying that I fully agree with what the Secretary General of the GCC in his comments about how the GCC and Saudi Arabia deal with the rest of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, the esteemed Foreign Affairs magazine has accurately described our time in its special centennial issue of September October 2022 by saying by calling it the age of uncertainty indeed our world is in a state of uncertainty and therefore in a state in a state of strategic volume and strategic confusion mm. such international strategic confusion is caused mainly by the conduct or lack of conduct policies or lack of policies and if i may say hypocrisy of great powers at the helm of the supposedly rule based international order the relative world peace and security that the world enjoyed since the end of the second world war multilateralism interdependent world economy globalism and human achievements during peace time are all seriously threatened by this state of uncertainty our world is by its nature a multipolar world as reflected in the structuring of the united nations security council veto power however bipolar and unipolar worlds were reflections of the balance of power in all aspects of power at the time our world today is not the world of 1945 therefore thinking of a new approach free of the mentality of the cold war is needed to manage our transforming multipolar world in an orderly and peaceful fashion to escape what Graham Allison calls the Thucydides trap in his book Destined for War discussing the future of America and China relations I and as many in this world have been for many years calling for the need to reform the United Nations system particularly restructuring the united nations security council to reflect the aspirations of the world community and to express the structural changes transforming our world many reform initiatives were presented and all calls for the reforming the united nations security council to be fair inclusive and equitable fell on deaf ears of the five permanent members for the first time however many world leaders including president biden in his latest speech at the united nations general assembly called for such reform this call does reflect a change in mind by the united states to save what is regarded as a liberal rule based international order this liberal order cannot be sustained as liberal if it is not fair inclusive equitable and reflective of our international reality continued uncertainty is leading to uncertain behavior by irresponsible powers and leaders that may lead to catastrophic consequences ladies and gentlemen the disastrous 
deplorable war on Ukraine is only one case at hand that shows how fragile is our world and how much we all need to hang on to the principles of international rules and laws. It is my hope that this war comes to an end soon with the preservation of Ukraine's independence, integrity, and sovereignty. However, more escalation, more world polarization, wider confrontations, a return to the dictate of geopolitics, power politics, spheres of influence, and the return of the long forgotten practice of conquest are the prescription for continued uncertainty. No country will be safe and secure in this state of anarchy. Therefore, the principle of self-help and self-survival may become the order of international politics if great powers of today fail their responsibilities in pre preserving world peace and security. It is only through international wisdom, cooperation, and leadership that the world can avoid the potential disasters that face us at this juncture. No region, ladies and, world, and, and gentlemen, in our world has felt the impact of the state of international uncertainty more than the greater Middle East region. Indeed, the Middle East itself has been in a state of uncertainty for the last two decades. Who is to blame for this continued situation is an open question. However, while countries and leaders of the region bear a distinct responsibility, the rest of the world also bears the biggest share of this responsibility because the region was, for the last eight decades, part of the international and regional security architecture. American withdrawal from Afghanistan uh, is an end to an era. Doubtlessly, such development with the outstanding perceived uncertainty regarding American presence and role deepened the state of regional doubts about the U.S. commitments in the region. Naturally, allies and friends of the United States in the region started to rethink and reconsider their future away from the Western dominant paradigm that dominated the geopolitics of the region during the last few decades. However, had Ukraine not happened, the world, and particularly countries in the Middle East, would have continued struggling to find an answer to this question. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Vladimir Putin, president of a great power, a permanent member of the UN Security Council, was the first one to answer that question by invading Ukraine disregarding international law despite all of his claims. Ukraine was the first victim of that perception of the international strategic vacuum and the lack of world leadership and the weakness of international alliances. President Putin is not the only one trying to take advantage of such a situation to impress his will on the world stage and to change the international status quo. It seems that this war, by the alarm it created across Europe, the United States, and other allies, reinvigorated and put to rest growing doubts about American global leadership and its commitments to its allies. Is this sustainable? I hope so. But we in the Middle East, and especially in the Gulf region, want to see such commitment to our region's peace and security. The war in Ukraine is highlighting the permanence of the strategic importance of the Gulf Cooperation Council. 
and the whole world in terms of energy security and the stability of the world economy. Therefore, preserving its peace and stability is an international necessity. This may be a catalyst for the Americans and the Europeans to reconcile their indecision toward conflicts in the region and in standing up for the outstanding threats to the security and stability of the region. This cannot be realized without real and serious commitment to regional security and the security of their important partners with the full respect of their sovereignty and their national choices. It is heartening to see how our friend, the United States, came forward to share with us the concern about the recent credible threat of an imminent Iranian attack on Saudi Arabia. That is not surprising, and it demonstrates what President Biden repeated frequently, that America stands with the kingdom to defend it from any attack. The visit of Joe Biden a few months ago to Saudi Arabia and his meeting with Arab leaders was an opportunity to eliminate all doubts about American commitments to peace and security in our region and to reset the U.S. relationship with its allies and friends by converging their strategic national interests. This trust must be re-established. We still believe in the importance of this relationship. This is a constant amid all uncertainties. However, the latest differences of views between our two countries is no reason to turn our backs to each other. While facts refute false claims, OPEC Plus's decision was a consensus decision by all members of the group, and it was to rebalance the world market as the decline in oil prices has shown, and to sustain balance in the global energy markets. Also, there is no shortage of oil supply in the oil market. As to the Kingdom's stance on the aggression on Ukraine, the Kingdom voted for the two UN General Assembly resolutions condemning Russia's invasion and the Russian decision to grab Ukrainian regions. Also, it is offering generous humanitarian aid to Ukraine and offering its good offices to mediate when possible between the two countries as materialized lately by the exchange of war prisoners, including the release of some American prisoners. Ladies and gentlemen, Saudi Arabia is engaged in building its geo-economic development not only for its own sake, but for the interest of its region and the world. We hope that the United States will continue to be part of our future success as it was in our past successes. Saudi economic strategic partnership with other countries was never at the expense of our relationship with the United States. Therefore, let us work together when our national interests converge and manage our differences when we disagree through serious official dialogue as we have done for the past eight decades. In conclusion, I reiterate what I have mentioned many times on this podium. We in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia are attentive to the responsibility and the noble intentions, and as emphasized by the custodian of the two holy mosques, King Salman bin Abdulaziz, on all occasions, we will cooperate and collaborate with all who mean well in order to deal with the challenges facing us. The aim is to bring security, stability, and peace to our countries and our people to attend to our future. Crown Prince Mohammed described the relationship between us and the United States as 90% agreement and 10% to be discussed. The Kingdom welcomed 
President Biden and reached agreement on many issues. Just read the joint communique that came out of the visit. It reflects the strength and depth of the partnership, which is critical not only for the region, but for the whole world. I am also encouraged by administration officials who have described Saudi Arabia as a partner in meeting challenges. Saudi Arabia and the United States have shed blood together in the fight against terrorism and aggression. They should look upon that as a springboard to go forward to meet the challenges facing humanity. Now I will tell you a story. I remember in the midst of the oil embargo, after I was appointed as liaison to intelligence services in 1973, during the Ramadan war, when a message came from Mr. Kissinger to the late King Faisal, God rest his soul, through the CIA station chief in the kingdom. Mr. Kissinger didn't want to have his signature on that message. The message was brief, but crystal clear. It said, Your Majesty, if the oil embargo continues, the United States will seek to find ways to redress it. End quote. The threat could not have been clear. I had the duty to deliver that message to my late father as he was preparing to go to bed. The embargo, ladies and gentlemen, continued for a few more months until the United States took effective action to affect the Israeli retreats from the Suez Front and from the Golan Heights. A few weeks later, the late King Fahad, who was then second deputy prime minister, led a large delegation of Saudi officials to Washington to sign an agreement of cooperation on many issues with the United States. The man who signed the agreement on the American side was the same Henry Kissinger, who a few months before had threatened to invade Saudi Arabia. Ladies and gentlemen, the present difference of views between our two countries can be resolved as before. Thank you very much.